will be joining in within a few minutes. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Today is the concluding session of our special for fun learning from the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. And we are ending the program with a very special panel discussion today. And today's panelists include um, Saiful Hawk from Dhaka, Andrea and Aike Rose Wattlinger from Germany, and Rupani Kutte from Mumbai. And today's panel will be moderated by uh, Kazi Khalid Ashraf. Uh, I will in briefly introduce Professor Rupani Kutte before our beginning. Uh, um, she is an architect, an urbanist, and artist based in Mumbai. She is a professor at the School of Environment and Architecture. Her work often crosses disciplinary boundaries and takes different forms, such as writing, teaching, and drawings. Much of this work involves extensive research on contemporary South Asian urbanism with a focus on architecture and built environment. Now I'll pass it on to the moderator for today, Professor Kazi Kalidashri. Mm. I pass it back to you, perhaps, so we can keep doing that. Well, uh, no, um, we thought it'd be a good thing to do a concluding discussion. Uh, we spent a month, uh, we had about 12 lectures, is that right for us? Oh, well, 14 actually in total. 14, right. And this we, is the 14th we, session, right? Right, this is the 14th session, 12 lectures and two panel discussions. Panel discussions. And I think uh, all in all, we had some really good uh, talks um, and I think the participants, I want to thank them. Um, they are they were diligently listening, they were present, uh, they were involved um, and I, I'm hoping that today they can get more involved because this is the last chance to <laughs> enter the discussion. I would like to hear from them what they're thinking from the talks, the presentations, the panel discussions, um, whatever comes to mind. I think, although we called it learning from the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, uh, we don't have to be so precise as like learning from the Aga Khan Awards all the time. I think what's more important is what the Aga Khan Award triggered in architectural discourse, architectural culture worldwide, uh, and <clears throat> what, uh, how much impact that it had, it has on uh, architectural conversation now uh, is something more important to us. So we are working on a broader theme. And just for everyone's recollection, and spe especially for uh, Rupali's information, we had like four uh, themes, uh, one for each week. Um, <clears throat> I think the first week was the validation of architecture, which had to deal with how awards like this becomes inst institutions whereby what is sort of, you know, the appropriate, proper, or the new trend, they get validated and <clears throat> it then circuit the ideas or the, or the, the paradigm circulate amongst the architectural uh, circle. So that was one. Secondly, uh, we wanted a discussion on the public realm. And I think for, and then uh, thirdly, the community realm and then the urban realm. So uh, I think I can fairly, it will be fairly a good idea to say that we want to discuss architecture in the broader perspective, not architecture within its autonomous uh, condition, if you like, uh, architecture as a thing, an object, which also, you know, fine, we can discuss that, we have discussed that, but how, <clears throat> architecture impacts the broader realms from the public to the city to the community. And I think we had had some discussions around that. So um, we uh, also looked at a few Aga Khan award winning projects and two of them are, are here, Saiful Hawk and IK. Um, and we had a couple more, a couple others. We, uh, as I said, you know, we uh, looked at some of the critical thematics uh, uh, generated by the Aga Khan Award. And I must say that what the Aga Khan Award has done since its inception in the late 70s, uh, they held confer conferences, they published books, and therefore generated uh, a conversation. And out of that, a number of topics, perhaps, you know, and I, as I mentioned, uh, I think last time that, you know, Saif and I grew up uh, in a time when the Aga Khan Award sort of, you know, landed in the horizon, in, in, with an erupt, it erupted literally, uh, and we had the opportunity to see some of the things that we had not uh, expected. 
For example, the big seminar that was held in Dhaka, and I, I give some of this as a kind of premise for a discussion. You can pick up on some of this, and we can have a, we can continue to the, continue the discussion. In 1983, the Afghan Award for Architecture held a major international seminar in Dhaka. I, I find it as a turning point, uh, both uh, not just for Bangladesh regionally, and I would say regionally in a much broader sense than just the Indian subcontinent. <clears throat> for the first time uh, in the subcontinent, you had the presence of some, uh, you know, fantastic stalwarts uh, from Charles Correa to Minette de Silva to Jeffrey Bawa, uh, Saif, I believe Raj Rival came also, right? And then from beyond the subcontinent, you had Kenneth Frampton, Paul Rudolph, uh, I, I'm, I'm forgetting some names. I mean, that was the first time we witnessed, and I say the word witness, Jeffrey Bawa in action. You know, first of all, we haven't seen in 1983, his work was not published, you know, and I don't believe we have seen anything before that. But he was already quite matured by then, and his work had a body of work. And what we saw on the screen, that was the most stunning thing that at least personally I had ever witnessed. And I think after that, as you know, nothing was the same anymore. Uh, the uh, the Mimar books published Bawa's work. It published Charles Correa's work. So if you look at historically, and I think some scholars need to do that, 83, and the next 10 years were really wow. remarkable in establishing some of the uh, intellectual norms uh, for, the, for the practice in the subcontinent and beyond. And then of course, you know, I say that, and also uh, <clears throat> for us to engage with a wider ge geographic range, you know, Arab architects, Indonesian architects, African architects, even South American architects through Mimar or the discussion. And I think that opening up is something that I would like to emphasize here, whether you, you, you want to say a little bit about that. I say this because Conrad Ng, uh, one of our speakers from very far away, Honolulu, I think he said something quite uh, straightforward but remarkable that we all have a shared fate, shared fate. And I, it's not just like climate change and so on and so forth, but I think as, as part of humanity, we all have a shared fate. And what the Aga Khan Award triggered was architects looking at each other. Even now we have uh, architects from Germany, from India and Bangladesh and throughout the session and perhaps in a kind of fortunate way, uh, the Zoom opens up new possibilities, although it has its own limitations we can engage with each other, even though we live far away. So uh, architects looking at each other in a way not done before. And it's not like uh, Euro-American architects looking at each other and occasionally looking at Japan or occasionally looking at China, but really now a global architectural platform. Architects looking at each other, uh, reviewing, assessing, critiquing each other. So what do you think about that? Anyone? Are we learning from each other? I, can, can I just say quickly here? I, I will point to, point this out to IK because uh, it's not IK has worked in Bangladesh. She's working in Bangladesh, and I think the the knowledge and the technology is not one. He is he is a seriously established, a remarkable architect. Uh, in some of his work, he has incorporated, and he was showing that the other day, some of the techniques of buildings in rural Bangladesh into ur urban Germany. Am I right, IK, in saying that? Yeah, we learned quite a lot, I'd say, and um, there are different levels and links. No? Mm -hmm. one, one question is, for sure, building technology or construction way of construction, using material, sustainable designs. I think that we can learn a lot from vernacular architecture and from the traditions. And then that was a nice melange of, you know, local knowledge, local craftsmanship. We could learn in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning point when we started there with Anna in 2004, where we just uh, were uh, kind of traveling, researching for her final thesis and where we have you really had the time for about four weeks to be in Rudrapur, sit in the 
on, on the road level or on the street or the you know rice field level and see how interaction between craftsmanship, uh, local resources and handmade construction uh, to learn from that manner of way of construction that because we don't have this level of craftsmanship any longer in our mm -hmm. culture no? so that people build for themselves even if there are also always specialists in the villages no? because there's a group of people working with bamboo there's another group working with earth because they used to work with that materials or they are advanced let's say they have their uh, developed skills and but designing through the, the um, uh, resources of craftsmanship and, and uh, the local materials was quite interesting. And on the other hand, we came from Europe with our um, knowledge on natural materials because our, our office was more advanced already to that time in 2004 in uh, how to construct with earth. And you know many people look to Europe and so there was you know, a work or discussion, let's say, not, it was more like a discussion with the people on ground and interaction, um, what is, what is, what moved into a, a, a way of building of a construction system, uh, uh, special construction for the first floor, the bamboo structure, the rooftop, etc. And that was, you know, woven together in that first weeks when I touched ground or we together touched ground in, in Rudapur. And what we really learned is a different thing is that, you know, people trust to each other, uh, not trusting in lawyers. You know, we used to have lawyers in every second of our life to, to tell us what to do, to tell us how to interact and to, you know, we feel like we could protect with that, but we are losing you know, social connection. And that was the, the main thing, you know, we learned like really working on an equal level, really working together with everybody on site, with the craftsmen, you know, because we started building with um, COP and try to, to imagine how that could work because it's a traditional way of working, this earth straw mix, what wasn't done in Germany since more than 100 years. And, but we, we thought this technology could work, but then we failed. And then the, the Bangladeshi craftsmen took over and told and, and said, okay, let's try like that. And then it, immediately there was a, a language of, of craftsmanship as well and doing together on site. And so we learned from that end and also from this very positive thinking and approach, you know, to sit together in one boat and to, to have a project together, follow one idea together. And that's something I really learned and with what we brought back to, back home here. And then we watched on the school and Meti, Meti system, how they sit, the students sit together in one uh, uh, cycle, circle and, you know, learn from each other and, you know, having interaction with the full group at any time of the, of the day when they work in this uh, circles that's something what we do with our students here now that we are part of that still of this way of thinking and interaction and so our students now work with the same system we, i have seen in bangladesh and they are having interaction with uh, communities here in berlin no? and doing the same thing what what got lost in our culture and i think these kind of bridges are very important and um yeah, you need a lot of time to get into it and, uh, you know, to lose your, what you learned at school, you know, because architects have a very prominent and very important role usually in life and society. <laughs> we learned a lot of regards that. And um, yeah, I think this, this way of interaction is very, very nice. And then um, how we did it at the time in 2004, five and six, when we have uh, designed and built the school was more like, you know, a personal interaction and there was not a big theory on top of it. And there was this learning really came later when we received the award and then this bigger discussion started and then a new view from outside had, has put spotted on, on, on that place and on, on the way of working. And then we learned a lot and then we tried to really take it with us. And yeah, that's, that's the two aspects. And the third thing is really to make things easier and uh, basic, simple to reduce all our, you know, 
the imagination of using machines uh, and technology to solve any problem, engineering, engineering, and so, on. so go down to the simple needs for a better future. Yeah, that's maybe the three things we, we learned especially and what got really framed from the awards because that discussion and the interaction with this network was amazing for yeah. us to, to, to really change our approach, let's say. Rupali, you have uh, something to add here at this time? Yeah, no, I, I really like this idea of uh, shared faith. Uh, because I think that's something that is important for us to kind of move from um, often our ways of doing things have been governed by modern frameworks, right? And I think those modern frameworks have almost become technocratic ways, you know, like you said, whether it's dealing with climate change, it becomes then a problem to deal with rather than starting to look at structurally other ways of living lives, right? And I think that that's sort of a lot that we have to learn from each other. What does it mean to live lives differently? What is the structural logic of our spaces and where they come from rather than looking at precedents? So we're not learning from precedents, right? Because I think that's one of the dangers that you see something that's done successfully somewhere else. You take that up, you see that as a precedent and you replicate it. But instead, I think what we're learning from is logics of, of thinking of space, right? Logics of learning, uh, you know, culturally kind of working with each other and, and not in a parochial sense, you know? I mean, the, I think the older kind of regionalisms kind of also spoke about, um, you know, maybe limited ways of, you know, building and, and work thinking regionally. But we've also had fantastic exchanges across historically, uh, you know, from 2000 years ago as well, right? So I think what does it mean to structurally think of these exchanges and what is it that we can learn from each other, I think is important. And, and there's a lot of work left, I think, to be done there as well, you know? So I think, I, I mean, I'll leave it at that, but I think that's what is really sort of fascinating for us to learn from various cultures and perhaps in some ways diffuse some of those modern logics that have governed our lives and kind of universal ways so far. No, that's, that's great. Uh, Rupali, did you say shared faith, F-A-I-T-H? Well, I said faith, but, no, but faith could also be fantastic, actually. Well, I think it, it can be just fantastic. Conrad yeah. uh, suggested yeah. shared faith, F-A-T-E. Yeah. Yeah, but I think this is a great topic, and I think both applies. Uh, uh, it, it, the, the innovation of a shared faith yeah. or a shared fate. Yeah, I yeah. think I think we can we can pick it up at some point. Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, uh, Andre and Saif, you want to add something to this particular topic of an exchange? And I, I believe Charles had a Charles Korea had a uh, wonderful take on this in his theme of transfer and transformation. Okay. Let's talk about that. Uh, but anyway, Saif. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I think uh, it's an important uh, topic you have introduced, <coughs> learning from each other. I think uh, uh, when we are uh, in a situation that we are looking to learn, we, 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 we fix a uh, place that where we would like to uh, learn from. So, I mean, since the colonial times and the post-colonial period, this has been for us a one-way uh, interaction. You look uh, to the developed or the Western countries as the sources for learning. And we got detached from our uh, sources, indigenous sources of knowledge. The knowledge that was existing for thousands of years here. And even now, at times we are looking into our own things with the help of the others. When someone else shows, oh, this is a beautiful thing you have got. Oh, is this beautiful? 
because this is someone is telling you from outside that this is beautiful. So I think that needs to be overcome because if it is like that, that this uh, you have knowledge that is required or that is also valuable to others and there is knowledge that is also valuable to you. So you start a dialogue. It is not uh, one uh, way traffic of learning. So this is something that uh, here in Bangladesh, in South Asia, or in the colonized world, or the developing world, or the third world, whatever world we have been calling, has been happening. But now, with this climate change thing, and also with uh, the economic uh, uh, things, the uh, globalization and all this uh, issues, I think the world, in a way, uh, more importantly, the developed world, the developed countries, have realized that no, we need to look elsewhere also for uh, sustainable living. So that's how now I think that gradually that is changing and we all have something to offer to each other. So shared future, shared space, shared faith, that has to be, it is we are dependent on each other. It is not that I am the only one who knows what is the best, so I give you the knowledge, you take it, you follow it, or I think that, oh, that's the best knowledge that is around here, and I don't think that we have any knowledge. So this is what I would say about sharing or learning from each other. But one point, Aga Khan has created a platform or through all these recognitions, a kind of a knowledge which very much celebrates not the architecture as art or something, but architecture that goes indigenously, whether it is in Africa or whether it is in Bangladesh or in uh, Indonesia, this indigenous input into architecture has been greatly recognized by the Aga Khan and that is also good. Yeah. Right, no, uh, absolutely. You know, I think that's an area, a whole area that in our own backyard, in our own neighborhood, we had either overlooked, we have not given it an esteem that it, it needed for us to jumpstart our new trajectory in architecture, so definitely. But I, uh, I'm going to ask Andrea to respond to this question, but uh, I will enter, um, I, I will present something else. <laughs> Although we have a shared faith and et cetera, et cetera, but also is there a big difference occasionally, irreconcilable difference in approach and reality. I, I give two examples. One is what uh, Aike was just saying earlier, uh, uh, how perhaps they, uh, you know, found a learning uh, situation in Bangladesh. Uh, I, I remember an article by Peter Blake, a well-known architectural critic in Architectural Forum, I think the title was, if I remember correctly, who designs our buildings? And then he starts off by giving a long list. You know, the fire brigade person, the insurance ag agent, the lawyer, the accountant, it was a long list and certainly not the architect. So which means that uh, in European American context with uh, social development or what have you, <clears throat> you have laws, you have principles, and that's for the safeguard of the citizens, understandably and whatever economic uh, stabilization. On the other hand, uh, uh, in Bangladesh, what IK and others can do, they can be an architect all over again, right? So I don't know if that's a difference, uh, one difference that uh, one can think of. And Nader Ardalan, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, who, who said that there is homelessness in the United States, but there is no homelessness in Iran. Or for that matter, I would say, if I want to push it, India or Bangladesh, because people can build anywhere and have at least a home. They can be poor, but they can have a home. But in the United States, you can't do that. Uh, so I think there is that an irreconcilable difference. The other one, what uh, Ike and Andrea presented last time and mentioned that in Europe, the uh, direction for urban, uh, urban direction is 
uh, working with existing stock in cities, existing building stocks. While in Dhaka, for example, I don't know about Mumbai, uh, Rupali, demolish and build, demolish and build. You know, I think it's a constant process. Four stories demolished to six stories to 14 stories and 20 stories. I mean, that has happened in the last 20 years. So, um, Andrea, if you want to pick up on that, you know, the difference is also irreconcilable differences. Um, I think you described uh, them already quite nicely. Um, I think uh, in, in certain ways there are uh, differences. Uh, on the other side, when, when you talk about uh, demolishing uh, buildings, I think we follow you now as a, as a principle. Um, we, uh, we, we've experienced this in the past, unfortunately, also um, a lot. Uh, so maybe in, in that respect, um, uh, it's, it's not as, as um, what's the right wording, uh, distinct maybe or not in, in um, it's not with every building, but we, we can uh, feel this here as well. So there's uh, the, the respect for historic architecture seems to be lost a little bit um in the sense that um mainly the buildings from the um, 50, 50s 60s nowadays um architects current architects feel that there's no value to such a building or even worse it's driven by uh, the investors because they they don't look into the architecture they they look at um uh, the other part and unfortunately um, architecture gets very very speculative in in europe and in the western world so this this is definitely um a downside and uh, you are totally right in in europe we, we can't be an architect we're driven by by so many laws and and whatsoever that sometimes you feel why do you go uh, to an arch architectural um, study if everything um, afterwards is, is uh, limited by, by laws and, and standards. So I think we, we overdid this um, as many other things uh, completely. And I think we understand now that we, we have to turn around and, and we have to come back to, to reasonable level. And then I think it's, it's super valuable to have a look uh, at what we can learn from, from other countries. Uh, where this approach hasn't uh, taken place um, in order to remember us um, what, what, how it could be. Um, and I think the, the other thing um, uh, that's maybe something else I, I would like to add is um, where I can also see a difference. And my experience in, in Bangladesh was unfortunately was um, uh, very limited. I, I would have loved to come back um, and to, to continue, uh, but due to Corona, this was not possible. But um, what I felt, and as I think I can mention this uh, already, is um, there's an incredible um, trust and working on eye level um, with the people. And again, this is something I think we we lost, unfortunately. And um, for me, this was uh, was really um, such an, um, a, a great uh, experience that uh, we, we came with, a, I think, a challenging um, task. And the entire team would, would buy in and they would, would trust that we would come to a good solution. And I think sometimes um, in, in, in our context, it's very competitive. Um, th there's one um, uh, big man or big woman who, who knows everything. <laughs> and uh, nobody can sort of like can can contribute to to a, a communal experience and because there's there's always um, our life is so complex nowadays and i think every person can contribute with a different knowledge and then together we we come up with a, a, the best possible solution and i think this is totally totally lost in in uh, in our context and again i think this is something very important to to um go back and to to learn um again and to yeah to, to start in a collaborative uh, manner again and to share knowledge i think this is also something i experienced that uh, we have more like um due to this competitive uh, environment um we share knowledge up to a certain point um, where it, it helps us to become um, glamorous, but the, li the little detail in order to enable other people to, um, to make um, uh, uh, maybe a similar project in a, su a successful manner, I think this is, uh, is missing sometimes. 
And I think this, again, is something we should, I mean, if you look at research, it's, it's crazy, right? We're, we get public funding. Uh, and then once we have the results, we keep them to ourselves instead of um, working um, collaborative uh, together and, and sharing this knowledge. Well, a good example is knowledge for vaccine production. If I may say yeah. so. Right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Right. But you mentioned, mentioned something, yes, shared knowledge, but with it also comes trust or should come trust because I don't think you can share without trust. Um, I mean, and there are a lot of things that have happened historically, globally over the last 100, 200 years. Uh, I mean, what appears to be knowledge uh, then appears to be something else, you know. Um, and I, again, I, I, I use the example of vaccine for a different reason. Uh, people are not, some people are not willing to take vaccine because they don't have a trust. So I think just to kind of a reminder that I think shared knowledge also goes with trusting the sharing, trusting the knowledge also. Uh, but let me move on to another topic. And uh, I just picked up a few. And if any of the participants come up with something, please, you can jump in now or you can send a, a note to Farhad. Uh, Sh Shahida Fami, uh, a young Egyptian architect, uh, she was present yesterday. She discussed, talked about heritage and the contemporary. It sounded like sounded like or may not be, I can't judge right away, tradition and modernity, not necessarily. Modernity is one thing and contemporary perhaps is another thing. But, and then uh, Ike in his presentation and Andrea, you discussed, you talked about something like future, future oriented architecture with natural resources. Now, uh, is this an opposition or an oscillation? between heritage and contemporary, between future-oriented and natural? Uh, or uh, which, you know, how should we think about this? Well, I, I personally am not thinking as opposition, um, but um, as oscillation or even an assimilation. Or these labels doesn't matter. IK, you want, do you think uh, did I place it correctly? You said something about future-oriented architecture with natural resources. Am I right in saying that? Andreas, maybe you, you're going to start. You don't... And what do you mean by, and what do you, would you mean by future-oriented architecture? Why do you use that description? Um... Well, we, we use this um, description because what, uh, what we are um, noticing here, and probably not everybody is, is uh, um, on the same page, but um, I think uh, uh, Ike and I and our office is convinced that uh, we, we failed a little bit with our approach to architecture, not us as a practice, but the, the, um, the profession in the sense that we're using um, far too many resources and also um, uh, sometimes the wrong resources, put it that way. I think if you, if you keep a brick building uh, up for years and years and years, then that's perfectly fine. But if you wanna uh, renew it from time to time, then it becomes very, very difficult. And um, we have a massive problem with, uh, with uh, resource consumption and waste. And that's why we uh, bank on regrowing um, materials in order to be future oriented, because we know that we, we run out of sand for, um, for concrete construction. We know this. Um, I think in Indonesia, 24 islands disappeared because of sand robbery, right? So, I mean, th this, is, this is dramatic. Um, th there, there are other uh, resources that are, uh, fairly limited and where we will experience um, uh, fairly soon uh, what, what it means if, if they um, if they uh, if we don't have access to them and the other thing I think is also that um, um, if, if you if you plant a tree uh, it's also good for the environment and um, harvesting the tree is not uh, harming the environment whereas if you go down deep into 
into Mother Earth, then you're talking about totally different uh, environmental impact. And the other thing is that that's probably from our research that um, natural resources are uh, more beneficial when it comes to this whole idea of um, circular construction to reuse the material again, to, um, to uh, define reversible connections and so forth. I think that that's um, uh, our approach to that. Right, you know, I think it relates to something else. I, I believe IK said uh, that a building is not enough. Am I right in saying, uh, in picking that up line? A building is not enough. There is a pre-story and a post-story. But what Andrea is saying, you know, before building, which is, you know, uh, made, now we discussed building versus assembly last time. Uh, it is made, and I think there should be decisions about resources, whether natural or otherwise. So there is a sort of a premise to a building. It just doesn't happen right away. And then there is a, a story uh, or, the, or the, whatever, the narrative of the building afterwards. So I think, I think I, I'm very, I'm in favor of expanding on this idea. A building is not enough. But while most training in architecture happens around that singular autonomous, a thing by itself thing. Um, Rupali, uh, you, you know, uh, in school is that kind of... Yeah, yeah. I think I just to kind of uh, maybe talk about like the difference that we make between these ideals of heritage and, and the contemporary. Right. Um, you know, often these labels are, are, are completely misleading exactly because we think of the building as an object, right? Like I, I think, I mean, I'll just give you one fantastic example. There was, uh, you know, when, when Bharat Bhavan was built, the this building, fantastic building by Charles Korea. The person who actually set it up was uh, Jay Swaminathan, uh, this artist. And, and he, when he set up this place, he invited you know, both artists from you know, other cities, you know, Mumbai and other places, but also this artist, Jangar Singh Sham, from, uh, you know, from, the, from the Gond uh, forests, right? Like from the forest of Madhya Pradesh. And he didn't call him a tribal artist or anything, right? He was as contemporary as the artist from, from the urban places. And because he brought a way of thinking of life that was completely different, he spoke about the forest, you know, with, with this idea of myths and, and this idea of fluid spaces, and was as contemporary as, as the urban guys were thinking of new ways of living life, right? So I think if we can shift from thinking of the building as an object, to starting to think of ways of life. And I think that's where pedagogy also needs to start leading us towards. And, and that's when you start thinking of, you know, the idea of the spatial, the idea of spatial justice and other things. I think that's where we really need to go to, to you know, really to think of what is this future that we are then, you know, building. So, yeah. I very much like that idea. Um, Saif, you want to add something here? Yes, uh, I think uh, what we need to do is to understand the, uh, <coughs> the idea of new. I mean, we already have things existing. So when we talk about heritage, or when we talk about future, Safe, safe. I'm sorry, just to interrupt, but I just want to add to that idea of the new. I think it's more like the mythology of the new. The new has gotten so much mythologized, and we pursue myths. You know, that's how we are kind of uh, trained. You know, but well, anyway, uh, go ahead. Well, yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm looking into that every day we are encountering new demands. <clears throat> For example, before air travel, there was no need for airports. So once air travel started, and so we started requiring airports. And then if you look at our uh, demand for housing, because every day we are adding new people uh, on this earth, population has been increasing. So the, this is something that you need to have these things and new demands are put forward. And how do you satisfy these new demands? 
And the other is that replacing the old with new. You have something that is existing, but because of the speculative nature of land and properties and all this thing, you increase the value of some area, you get rid of this existing building or something, mm -hmm. and you want to make things new. So I think we need to be very careful about that before we get into the building, ascertaining this idea that what exactly do we need new? Just make a simple, straightforward calculation. Things will uh, develop. So many people are going to be added. We need, these people are not properly housed, so we need to have these houses. And then you decide how this new will be provided for. So you can make exact things instead of uh, going into this kind of a little, I mean, uh, vague notion that, no, 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 we need to uh, have this area because this has more potential for development and all these things. So careful consideration of the new in the existing is very important. And then coming to the building, which is now has become a critical issue, the way we are building the new. These new buildings require resources which have uh, this issue of availability. If you want to build with concrete, you have to get this uh, limestone from a place, you have to bring it, set up a huge industry, and then you can build a high rise with concrete or steel. Because for example, in Bangladesh, we don't uh, have those mineral resources and we have to get it. But now we have found that, no, concrete is not a sustainable or uh, carbon uh, neutral material. So we have to go into something different. But what has happened that we chose this, we decided this is the material for future. And we had embarked on a journey for a long time. We've been traveling in that direction that we have to build something in that way. So these are the things which we need to deeply think. And I think that what uh, Andrea and IK are trying to promote about this circular economy. But I think it is not going to be a closed circle. It has to be a spiraling circle because as the population grows, we have to have this circle also growing. So we have to look like a, a spiral. I mean, it is going and uh, uh, satisfying the demand for new. And we really have to look for also technological fixes, not the fully dependent, but for our modern and evolving needs. I mean, these days we cannot, like this meeting that we are having, this technology is making it happen. If it was not there, we would have still said that, okay, once the pandemic is over, we will convene and we'll have a meeting. But, but this, there is a lot of hardware, software, energy requirement this new technology requires. So they need to be also calculated. And also ways that IK and Andrea have also touched uh, in their presentation about waste, the amount of waste that is generated by all these new things. So how can we create a world, a culture, a society that tackles these issues and create beautiful architecture? Because at the end, we want to have architecture. Yeah, that's it. Okay, from my side, I may have one uh, last uh, topic to throw in to the group and maybe there are others who can pull up some other topics. And I think it relates to how Saif ended. Uh, <clears throat> I think we can agree or we can also disagree that uh, how modern architecture uh, started. Uh, I think there was a very strong social justice theme, if, if you agree with me because you know the whole business of housing housing for all classes in europe especially coming out of a socialist agenda of all the countries 
in the 1920s and 30s, even earlier. So I'm, argue, I'm placing the idea that modern architecture was based on social justice, but what now? Now it seems that architecture has ruptured itself from such matters of social justice to the point that architecture is standing at loggerheads with such things as equality, social justice, social goodness, you know, there's an opposition. You know? uh, I wonder if you agree to that because we see that in, you know, cities are planned, but a big, you know, large group of people are not being able to avail the good of that city. They are either mi minorized, minorized or marginalized. Uh, and therefore the whole business of discrimination is in practice. Sometimes it's so subtly embedded and I say that for any city in the world, you know, I have had the chance to live in many cities, you know, it's so carefully pack, packaged uh, marginalization. I wonder if you agree to that, you know, that architecture has now, or say mainstream architecture, and therefore there, there could be other kinds of architecture, which Frampton would argue as architecture of resistance, uh, but mainstream architecture has kind of slipped away and now is in confrontation with social goodness, but it pretends to be, you know, something substantial. I wonder what you think, anybody. A participant can join in also, anybody. I think I, think I made a good point there. <laughs> Rupali, you have something to say, I can see that. No, I'm just, I'm just saying that, you know, yes, um, I completely agree modern architecture sort of was, um, you know, on the foundations of social justice and, you know, the series of debates there. But I think it also laid the foundations for a universal way of thinking, you know. And I think that's where, like, the idea of the mass, the idea of the new, you know, like, the, the idea of newness, the idea of, of, of the universal, um, you know, almost sort of, uh, you know, led to the starting of a clean slate. Um, and, and, so, and so if, for example, for the future, if we kind of are able to shift this idea of thinking from the idea of social justice to spatial justice, I think there's a lot to learn from, um, you know, cultural logics of, of thinking and working, maybe, you know, not thinking of property ideas of, of working, but maybe, you know, ways in which uh, spaces work in diffused ways and, and ways that, uh, you know, sharing happens. I'm, I'm just thinking of, um, you know, landscape. I'm just thinking of the region, you know, I'm thinking of the Bengal region, both in India and, and, uh, and, and um, Bangladesh, like the, the whole idea that you would have the same land shared by farmers and, and fisher folk, you know, would not have been at all imagined by, by, by a kind of modern sensibility. You know, so I'm, I'm just thinking that perhaps that idea of, of this of social justice today requires to maybe shift to think of new kinds of social justices which come from more spatial logics of thinking. Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Okay, uh, I think your idea suggestion for a new course ways of life becomes more and more uh, significant and more and more dense and dense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, anybody at this point or uh, Farad, should we open it up? Yes, I believe if the participants would like to ask any question to the panelists, please feel free to do so. Uh, well, in the meantime, I actually have a question for all the speakers here today. Uh, we, we talked about um, future-oriented designs and social justice and all that, but uh, what about climate justice? I mean, when you're talking about architecture and design and all of that, what makes me wonder is that, I mean, 20 years from now, what will happen in the global south? Because we will be facing, we are actually facing the far worse consequences of climate change, even though we contribute much less um, carbon emissions and much less to the greenhouse effect. So in, in, in such a context, how do you uh, as architects or as designers, as, as built, built environment professionals, how do you uh, motivate yourself or how do you keep yourself positive that, uh, that one day, you know, one day maybe this, this effects of the climate change may not hamper our daily lives as, as we are afraid it might. 
Yes. I think this is directed to Saif. I have a feeling. <laughs> no, I think it's directed to all of us. Right. But it's interesting that uh, I think it's, 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 it's 30 years now that we have been uh, noticing, talking, <clears throat> trying to do a lot of things about this uh, climate change issue. And what has happened has happened for about 200 years, I mean, since uh, 18th century, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So what offered something of a promising future, 200 years have landed us in a situation that we are thinking that life may not exist unless we can do something about this warming of the planet. And in order to do that, we have to take very urgent and very uh, radical uh, steps. And since the, uh, this, what you call uh, the agreement came into effect, I think it was from 2014, the Paris Agreement. So uh, this year, I think it was seven years, and when we met for this conference in Glasgow, we found out that what we wanted to do based on that agreement, we have not yet been able to do this. There are a lot of sort of pressures from different uh, parties involved. And uh, even in this uh, last conference, we found out that yes, we will continue with our efforts and everything because 2030 is one benchmark year, 2050 is one benchmark year, and 2100 is the uh, ultimate year. So the idea is to keep the warming of the temperature within two degrees Celsius, better if we can keep it within 1.5 degrees Celsius. In order to do that, we have to radically change the way we are living, today, the way we are building today, the way we are traveling, the way we are consuming. So it's a huge and mammoth uh, task. For countries like ours, as far as you have said, our imprint is very little. It is the industrialized countries who bear the maximum responsibility. And unless that is happening, we will be in the receiving end and we have to look for ways how we can tackle this. Okay, there is talk of uh, sharing of resources, investments coming, helping and everything. But I think each country, each society, each community should also prepare some uh, plans how to adapt even this 1.5 degree Celsius increase happens because that is going to change the environment. Our uh, uh, life will become different. Not only that places will go under water, but temperatures increasing, fires happening. So there's a huge thing and architects, I mean, okay, uh, IK and Andreas, I think are uh, lucky that they have got a huge lab uh, with them where they can carry out this research experiments and they have got all this support. But here in Bangladesh, when I look at our resources, I mean, carrying out such advanced researches about uh, uh, doing all these calculations, collecting data, analyzing them, there is a big uh, uh, difference. So uh, if we want to face it, like for example, the school that we designed, we made it a very basic construction. Not much of a technology technological input has gone into it. We relied on whatever uh, knowledge. But if we have 
advanced labs, if we have scientists like that who are uh, engaged uh, with this kind of facilities, I'm sure we can also prepare uh, accordingly. And we don't need to increase our carbon footprint, that is for sure, but we can look for a life that is not much different from someone else in terms of the standards of living. I mean, I don't expect that people in uh, uh, Germany or in USA are living in this kind of standards and in Bangladesh people are living with a different standard uh, that's because we cannot uh, get that resources. So we have to look into all those things. Big, big things for us. So we need to prepare ourselves accordingly. I think IK uh, or Andrea can add a bit uh, on this. Um, yes, I think it's a, it's a very, very good question. And it's a very, very tough question. And I think, unfortunately, you are absolutely right. And I think you should stand up and speak out louder and, and, and tell this because, um, I mean, we, we try to do a lot for a sustainable architecture, but sometimes, um, and also us, our practice is not always achieving uh, the best possible result. We have to say this, right? And, um, and I said already, we, we need to make a, also a bigger shift. We, we do far too much new construction, even though if it's in timber, um, still, I think we should reduce. We, we should really focus on existing buildings and get, get sort of like um, our focus um, shifted. But um, I can, you correct me, it's obviously very interesting for an architect to design a new building. So I think we have to be critical with ourselves um, as well. Um, the other thing that frustrates me sometimes a lot is that um, if I look up uh, the journals and um, when I see the, the construction projects going out there or when I see what competition has won, then I think, Jesus Christ, our profession hasn't understood where we're at. And it's, it's sometimes I feel if we do everything we do in our office is totally wiped out by one project from another large scale practice, you know, that I don't want to a name and shame here but but sometimes you just think jesus christ that we, we can design so many earthen and and, and uh, timber buildings it's impossible if if not everybody buys into that and so but what what's really unpopular here is really to um to go back and to say we have to reduce um unfortunately and then often the argument is that um us as a population in numbers is limited so if we if we change, that's that it, it doesn't in in the entire world it doesn't make a difference. And then I think that that's not that's not true. I haven't heard that. This is unbelievable. I think we have to really um, we we have to go forward and 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 make this radical change. And you should ask us to do so. I think that's uh, that's absolutely um, uh, you're right. And. Sometimes I wish that the consequences in our country would be much more visible, right? We had a, a, a terrible, terrible flood uh, this year and um, a lot of people died. This was really, really bad, but it's not enough. People are not learning from that and it's only affecting a, a, a few um, but it's not, I think even us in Berlin, we are too far away. We, we you know, you, you see the images in the, um, on the news and you, you obviously you feel that this is, this is really bad, but it's still too far away. So I think the consequences here should be much, much, yeah, more experienceable for us. And, but unfortunately we can't manipulate this and, and it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. The only other thing maybe to, to get out of this gloomy perspective is uh, that more and more people, and it's the younger generation uh, who understood and they stand up. And we had this um, Fridays for Future and uh, out of that it came Architects for Future and they get a much, much louder voice and they get heard. And th that's something where I think, okay, that's promising at least. Um, and older architects, they, 
they retire and they um, stop constructing in the wrong way and the, and the younger generation hopefully they 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 will be able to um, to demand for um, for other solutions and we should collaborate on that that's well, and if you see then the um, you know conservative guys here in germany if you know people from bangladesh for example point on germany those point on china they say oh well it makes you know, 2.00 point if we change our heating system, for example. You know? So it makes no sense that Germany starts. <laughs> That's crazy, you know, that, and, and um, still the new government, you know, they just, we know everything and they say, yeah, we need to have 400,000 flats a year, you know, no, not thinking even how and what they build, you know, they just said we need 400,000 flats a year. And that's you know there is already enough flats in Europe, no? Uh, and we've pointed out that in our in our um, um, uh, um, lecture. And then if you um, believe we have a factor ten to reduce, to come on an equal global level, it's a factor ten. So, and we have we measured that with our we did this very simple calculations with our students. So, even if you don't fly at all, if you don't eat any meat at all. If you do everything what you can do in your daily practice in Germany, you are still can do five, mm -hmm. but you're not. You're far away from ten. So we are. We have still. If you look, if you believe on CO two, so we have eleven tons per person. So if you have to come down to one, and if you do, if you do nothing in a way and still live there and exist in a way and consume, you know relaxed then you have six tons or five tons and then you cannot reduce it and then because the whole system is very carbon based and i think we need really and i hope the new government we will receive now will will be a little bit of a shift there will be not a major shift but a little bit of a shift now and um yeah but but i think it still needs always our examples and showcases no? But it always needs also a very scientific based or, you know, fact based um, discussion and that we really are able, you know, that we start opening our eyes at, e at, e at least no? so that we start thinking. And then we could, then we start imagining what the future could be. No? And if I see our, and, and Andrea was pointing a little bit on that point, but I'd just like to bring a focus from the other side, you know, we even don't even like to think about to change, you know? And we believe Germany has the knowledge. We believe everybody in the architect scene should know. And they, no, they, they don't see the problem of concrete. They don't see a problem of growth. They don't see a problem of a major infrastructure and destroying nature. They don't see it at all because they just like to continue. And that's a little bit the, the problem. We need to start opening our eyes. We need to start doing what we can at the time. And if we do what we know, you know, at, at least if we really have a, a, a focus or a community or a group of people who says, okay, we do everything what we can, that would be a major step. So, and I was, thinking about, you know, um, building up a community or a union of, of willing people, you know, and then in, in government bodies say, okay, there are, there's a group of young willing people. So they get in, 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 in power and we just let step back all the conservative guys, you know, bring the youth in power. I think that's the only way um, and, and start a kind of uh, a movement and really make things transparent. And say yes for sure. I, I'm, 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 you know, nobody is quite perfect. No? So that's for sure number one. But then nobody has to. Uh, so everybody has to be clear uh, where their fails are. No? And I think that's the way of part of discussion. And yeah, things we have to change. They are unbelievable big. You know, and um, we are with with all our money you know, whatever that means or is, or consume, whatever that means or is, I have to rethink all that and, and imagine something completely different. And in that sense, I think um, architecture as architecture will not be that important. Architecture as part of environment is getting the most important topic. You know, we have been, we have to, we have to think 
in our environmental, environmental boundaries. We have to think inside of our planetary boundaries. We have to do any action we do should be linked to that, you know, uh, relation. And if you don't, if you don't accept that, if you don't start to prove every every project being in relation to planetary boundaries or environment, um, if you don't start that open mindset and reducing things, okay, say okay, we don't do it, you know. And everybody is here in this building at the university. Everybody is fighting for every square meter to own it, you know, and to have, uh, you know, sign, signs on the doors, you know, the more doors you are owning, the more, the more important you are in that hierarchical machine here. And that's bullshit. It's all empty. There's nobody in. Why don't we kick it out? Why don't we reduce space? Why don't we rent in homeless people? Why don't we, you know, why start we build new? You know, that's all. And we need, we need to get into a completely different uh, thinking and, and, and also in experiments, no? And, and uh, we have to throw away all our fantastic denorms because that's all consumed norms. That's all fossil norms. That's all on concrete, steel, glass, aluminum. Why do we trust in that? That's bullshit. We don't need that any longer. Why do we trust still in modernism? Why, don't we, why do we trust in that period? That was a period, in a way it was social, but on the other hand, it's also the base of our consume. That's always also the base to, to, to you know, destroy our planet. So modernism is wrong. Glass is wrong. <laughs> steel, steel, concrete is, is wrong, you know. And that's, you know, what's, what's left on architecture. Maybe you can help me. Wow. So that was, that was, a, that was radical. I should, we should write it down and this could be a manifesto, I think. I mean, you're calling for a really a radical practice. I wouldn't call it radical architecture, radical practice, a practice that can be adopted by an architect or someone else. That architecture is part of the environment is number one. And uh, we need an intelligent practice versus a consumptive practice. And of course, you know, we need to define what that intelligent practice is. And I think we discussed some of that already today. So, but that's that's so brilliant and that's so uh, provocative, you know, IK and I, I, you know, we don't have enough time anymore today, but I think I would like to take that on, think about it, seriously think about it. This is what it means to be learning from each other and maybe uh, I'll think how to make something more out of this, what you just said, and what others have said. Okay, Farhat. Uh, do we have any uh, any questions from anyone? Yes, we have a question from a participant passing. Uh, she is asking that um, nowadays we see most of the buildings are mechanically ventilated rather than naturally ventilated in a country like Bangladesh. What is your per perspective on it? And is there any possibility that we will again start designing naturally ventilated healthy buildings in mass scale? This question is for all the panelists. I think uh, I could just answer that. Uh, say, but if he wants to, you know, expand that, sure, go ahead. Or Andre. Uh, no. Maybe just quickly. I think it's um, uh, absolutely right. We, we can design without um, ventilation. We should. Um, it's it's depending on the architecture itself. So if you if you come up with an intelligent scheme. Uh, you use um, chimney effects, uh, effects um, uh, nighttime cooling, and so forth. Um, it's possible, and you use the right materials. And then natural building materials like earth, you have this evaporative cooling effect, uh, are super helpful uh, to do so. So um, definitely, um, and it's much healthier. That's that's the other thing. Uh, this whole um, corona crisis. Uh, the, the mechanical ventilation systems, they are not helping. It's actually um, the opposite. So absolutely going for natural ventilation with, a, with the right architecture and the right materials. Okay. Switch it off, you know. <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> 
um, but I think, of, of course, some of these things go against the norms, uh, the kind of the status norms that each society has set up or whatever has adopted from somewhere else. And to go against the norms, you have to, there should be some exemplary uh, installations. You know, I think I can mention that, which then can, you know, you can't just go and tell a person who is building something, your client or developer, whoever that, no, no you, you can't do that. Right? You have to do this. I think it's also a question of convincing, question of, you know, making adjustment in the norms slowly, carefully. And if you have an opportunity, radically. But I think, yes, I think we, we should, we can start by raising these questions and then proceed very quickly from the questions to something that then can be well, carried out. Okay. Um, anything else? Yeah. Uh, well, you see, uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, I was just uh, about this uh, cooling of the environment. I mean, uh, I remember when we started uh, studying architecture, our first class, if I'm not mistaken, was on climate and design. And, uh, we talked a lot about, uh, we learned a lot about natural ventilation, passive cooling, uh, technologies, uh, uh, this kind of uh, thing. But what happened, that, that was left in the school as came to the practice, things were happening the opposite. If you need a, a heating, a cooling solution, you put a air cooler or air conditioner. But we were not uh, being aware of the impact of this mechanical cooling or this kind of uh, uh, cooling <clears throat> system. I, I'm saying that, okay, there are environments which will require that kind of temperature control, a sophisticated research lab, or some sort of a, a museum where you are having to preserve some of these artifacts and all these things. But not in a mass scale that every house, every apartment should be installing a, a air conditioner because it is cooling your home but it is hitting the exterior because it is basically exchanging heat. So the more air conditioners you put up, more hot you make your environment. So you need more cooling. So it's, it's a kind of a, a trap. So the more air conditioners, more uh, heating up of the environment. Instead of going for research into those kind of technology, the way we could use natural ventilation and keep our indoor uh, temperature cool, and things were being done in that way, but all of a sudden it all got lost. People, I mean, these ideas were uh, somehow became outdated. Oh, why do you go for all this stuff? So there is this simple solution put up an AC. And this is the price of ACs were coming down. There were the new technologies they are, they are coming to uh, offer you. So we need to, but that is again the work of mechanical engineers and architects also can participate about uh, making the environment cooler in the indoor environment. Anyway, uh, I think uh, that's a relevant question that has been asked. Um, so, any more questions from the participants? Well, if not, I think perhaps we can wrap up today's session and call it an evening. That's right. No, I think uh, before Farhat really wraps it up by shutting down the machine there, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, from what from my left, what I see in the screen, Saif. Andrea, IK, and uh, Rupali, thank you so much. You know, it was a very brief uh, encounter, I must say. Uh, but I think we covered a lot of things. You know, uh, we, we are almost on the verge of saving the world, but we think we should postpone it for next time. <laughs> right? 
and and uh, I would like to thank the participants, you know, again uh, for being with us and uh, uh, silently, quietly, and uh, even through the discussions, you know, you engaged us, you know, because you were, you know, we, we were always thinking about you, you know, even though we were talking to each other, we were thinking about you, you know, what you were taking. So with that note, thank you everyone. Good evening and good afternoon in Germany. Thank you to all the panelists and the participants. Have a good night. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.